Okay, remember that we were talking about the importance of boundary conditions in uh, in uh, in giving a Hermitian a self adjoint operator Hermitian properties, and this was the expression uh, that we were working with. We had we had uh, uh, the the uh, z uh, complex conjugate multiplied by l y integrated is equal to y uh, multiplied by l z complex conjugated and integrated, and uh, the only difference between these two integrals is the boundary term here. And we wanted to go through and analyze uh, what kinds of uh, what kinds of boundary conditions will uh, get rid of this. And, and I mentioned that uh, homogeneous boundary conditions, that is the Dirichlet, Robin, or Neumann boundary conditions all do that. Uh, so what we want to do here is to also show uh, that, um, that if we start with this Robin boundary condition, uh, so any function that we consider uh, we'll have the property that a linear combination of the function and the function's derivative at point A uh, have to add to zero. Then we have that u prime of A uh, is just proportional to the value of u at, uh, at that particular boundary. So what we're going to do now is, is just uh, walk through uh, this expression and note that what we have up here is actually the Wronskian of z and y. And uh, so let's see that. Uh, more more clearly in the boundary term. So if we look at the Ronskian of of a, uh, or the Ronskian at point a, uh, then this z y z prime y prime uh, becomes this, just using the fact that both z and y must now conform to this property. Uh, so so this now is the determinant that I have to evaluate. That pretty pretty uh, quickly simplifies to alpha over beta uh, with the uh, z y minus uh, y z and so um, so these these two terms obviously cancel at at uh, location a and so that makes this Ronskin at endpoint a equal to zero uh, so a similar boundary condition applied at x equals b would get rid of the Ronskin at location b and that would mean that the entire boundary term that is this thing that we've been talking about uh, for uh, this lecture now in the in the last one uh, is going to vanish uh, both endpoints the boundary term vanishes. And so what we're left with is uh, this inner product relation that was something that we saw for Hermitian matrices as well, but now we're seeing it for differential operators. So uh, this is really um, just one of the ways that we can recover Hermitian properties from uh, self-adjoint operators. Another common, common uh, situation that gives rise to um, gives rise to these uh, orthogonal eigenfunctions is that you impose periodic boundary conditions on the types of functions that you consider. And that's, that's to say that the function at A is equal to the value of the function at B and the derivative of the function at A is equal to the derivative of the function at B. And so you can imagine things like sines and cosines uh, will have this property where uh, B minus A is, is the period of the function. So the boundary term in this case uh, would be uh, expanded out in terms of the Ronskian determinants is P2 at B multiplied by the Ronskian at B minus P2 at A multiplied by uh, the Ronskian at A. And if we go through and we expand this, P2 at B term looks like this. Uh, the P2 at A term looks like this. I'm just computing these two determinants here and writing down the results. Uh, now, uh, what you notice is that this term in square brackets and this term in square brackets are really exactly the same thing because these functions Z and Y uh, must have this property that their values and derivatives are equal at the two endpoints. So here the only difference is the endpoints, so we can now factor the square bracket term out in front and we're left with P2 of B minus P2 at A. Uh, so what we learn here is that if, as long as that P2 term in your differential, uh, in your differential operator is uh, such that it's, it has the same value at boundary B as it does at boundary A, then periodic boundary conditions also will give that boundary term, uh, will make that boundary term vanish, and uh, that will also result in Hermitian properties. Now the most common way that you see this happen is when P2 of x is just one, and uh, so that's the case that gives us uh, sines and cosines. Uh, but, but in principle, there are other situations that could arise as well. Um, so, so what we're gonna do now is go through and do a, uh, a quick little example uh, and see um, and see how, how this works in practice. So let's take uh, this differential equation. This is an ordinary differential equation. So minus y prime prime equals lambda y. Uh, it's an eigenvalue problem. Uh, it's a self-adjoint operator. So the second derivative operator we've already seen is a self-adjoint operator. And we're going to impose on that, uh, on the solutions of this, we're going to say that they have to have 
homogeneous boundary conditions obeyed. So we have y of 0 uh, is equal to 0, and also y at 1 is equal to 0. So 0 and 1 are our a and b in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, page of notes. And now what we're going to do is we're going to consider three cases and see what values are going to be acceptable for uh, the eigenvalue in this equation, lambda. If we choose lambda equals 0, then our equation just becomes that the second derivative is equal to 0, right? You can look back and you can see uh, that if I put lambda equals 0 here, that term vanishes and we have y prime prime equals 0. We know that that gives rise to solutions of the form c1x plus c2, where c1 and c2 are integration constants. Uh, if we apply the boundary condition at uh, x equals 0, that says that y of 0 is equal to 0. Obviously, this term is going to vanish. Uh, but now we're left with c2 must be equal to 0. And so that says that we have to get rid of the c2 term. Uh, now, um, if we apply the boundary condition at y1, uh, then we have uh, that that's become c1 uh, plus c2 is already 0. So c1 has to also be 0. And so what we found here is that choosing an eigenvalue of 0 would only uh, allow solutions that are trivial solutions, and so it cannot be an eigenvalue, does not correspond to an admissible eigenfunction. Uh, we can now go on and talk about uh, the case when we uh, consider lambda less than zero. Uh, for convenience, we'll write lambda equals uh, some minus kappa squared. Uh, now our, uh, our um, differential equation uh, takes this form, y prime prime equals k squared y. Uh, the solutions for this are going to be exponentials, or for convenience, I can write them as sine hyperbolic and cosine hyperbolic. Uh, and uh, so we've got c1 cosh uh, plus c2 sine h with uh, kappa x as our arguments. Now, when I impose the boundary condition at x equals 0, uh, and I look at this term, sine hyperbolic of 0 is automatically 0, so we don't learn anything yet about this term. Uh, but uh, sine cosine hyperbolic of 0 is 1. So that says that the c1 term, that's all that's going to be left here, has to be equal to the 0 uh, from our boundary condition. So c1 has to, has to be 0. Uh, when I now plug in uh, the uh, y of 1 result, so that says sine hyperbolic of kappa uh, multiplied by c2, um, and, uh, and then, um, and then uh, so that, that's going to also require that I get rid of the uh, C2 term, the C1 we already know is 0 here. Um, so that term automatically vanishes already. And C2 is all that's left. And, uh, and so, um, so the C2 must also be 0. And so again, we found that using uh, a, a lambda less than 0 can only give rise to trivial uh, solutions. And so we will not get any eigenfunctions out of that. Let us try to go on now and talk about the uh, the case when I let lambda be a positive constant. So lambda equals kappa squared uh, to make the notation uh, convenient. So this now, uh, our differential equation, now looks like the differential equation describing simple harmonic motion. And uh, if I plug in my boundary conditions, I find that, uh, again, this, uh, this one vanishes. Uh, the cosine of, of 0 is 1. That says that the a has to be 0. So we immediately see that there are no contributions from cosines in our uh, set of eigenfunctions. Uh, we might have signs, however, uh, if we plug in y at 1. Uh, so then we're looking at b sine of uh, kappa uh, must be equal to 0. Uh, the amplitude there is completely irrelevant. We now just have to look at values of kappa that give us integer multiples of, of pi when I let x equals 1. Uh, so those are kappa equals uh, n pi. This x should not be here. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, so we have n equals 1, 2, and 3. Uh, kappa is just n pi. Omit this, this x. It's not, not supposed to be here. Uh, so, so the eigenfunctions of the second order differential operator minus d2 dx2 uh, with boundary conditions uh, that, that uh, the, func the functions are 0 at uh, x equals 0 and also at x equals 1 are given by these. So I've put a normalization factor in front of these. So it's sine of n pi x. Uh, and then I've got this 1 over square root of 2 for, for the normalization factor. And uh, I think that that is uh, what we wanted to uh, show in this, in this example. Okay, so I will stop there.